How's everyone doing today? It's good to see you all. Uh, let's start by opening in a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us, and we thank you for this time. We just ask, Lord, that you would be with me. Help me as I present your word, Lord, to do it truly and correctly, and help me to say not what I want to say, but what your word says and what you want me to say. We just ask, Lord, soften our hearts to your word, Lord. Help us to take these things and not just merely listen to them, but actually take action on those things, even the hard things, even the things that we don't want to do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This week was kind of a, a rough week for me as far as preparing the, the message. I probably changed what I was going to do two or three times back and forth. With Pastor Dean, you know, he's preaching each week exegetically. He starts and, you know, it's just the next chapter, the next verse, you know, going on down. And so each time when I come up, uh, you know, I'm like, Lord, what what do I speak about? You know, what, what, do you, what do you, you know, what, what does, it, what do people need? And so sometimes I, I really struggle with that, you know, and sometimes I go back and forth and uh, amongst the time once I finally decided what I was going to preach about, Thursday I was sitting there in my office and I was, I was working on my lesson and uh, I was stupidly, I looked at my computer and I said, I wonder what this button over here does. I've never touched that one. <laughs> I touched it and boom, my computer went like dark and it, you could barely see anything and you know, not, I couldn't even use it. And so then I spent all of Friday calling tech support, finding out that I had to take every file off my computer and crash reboot the whole entire thing. I spent all day Friday messing with my stupid computer. And sadly today, I mean, yes, we do have, you know, hard books that we can, you know, I still have some of those commentaries, but many of my commentaries are on my computer. So that, that made it, you know, kind of a, a, a tough week, a challenging week. You want to have Christian anger and throw that computer across the room, but needless to say, I didn't do that. But, um, you know, Pastor Dean asked me uh, about a week ago if I would preach and share the word while he was gone. And so I've picked out this important passage, and I'm going to read to you from Gulliver's Travels this morning. <laughs> no, really, I've got the book, see, right here. <laughs> and Gulliver's Travels was written by the Irish writer and clergyman Jonathan Swift in the year 1726. Gull Gulliver's Travels is what we would call a satire on human nature. Now, if you're not sure what satire is, satire is criticism with the intention of improving society. And sometimes it's done in a very witty way or maybe even you might say a funny way. And many of you probably, how many of you heard of Gulliver's Travels? Because you probably have seen the movie from I think the 1950s and then there was another remake, I don't know, maybe in the last 20 years or so, I think Jack Black did it. And it was the one where Gulliver's really big and all the people in the, that, that island he goes to are really small. Then there's another one where Gulliver's really small and all the people are big and there's different, different stories out of Gulliver's Travels. And so what I want to share with you today is from one of those stories. I'm just going to tell you part of the story, read some excerpts, and then really bring that into the scriptures and see, you know, help us with maybe, you know, an illustration that way. And so Gulliver, he was a sea captain, and he was set out on this voyage, and his crew mutinied against him. And so they took Gulliver, and they got him on a boat, and they, they marooned him on, on, this, on this distant island. You know, he'd never been there, didn't know where he was at, just out in the middle of the ocean. And so at this point, Gulliver lands on the shore, and you know, wow, it's a new and strange world, you know, and starts seeing different things. And so that's where I'm going to pick up, and I'm going to read some sections here to you as Gulliver describes what he is encountering, what he is seeing. <clears throat> In this desolate condition, I advanced forward, and soon I got upon firm ground, where I sat down on a bank to rest myself and consider what I had best to do. When <clears throat> Could somebody get me some water, please? Todd, thank you. When I was a little refreshed... <clears throat> I went up into the country, resolved to deliver myself to the first savage I should meet, 
and purchase my life from them by some bracelet, glass ring, or other toys which sailors usually provided themselves with in those voyages, and whereof I had some about me. The land was divided by long rows of trees, not regularly planted, but naturally growing. There was great plenty of grass and several fields of oats. I walked very circumspectly for fear of being surprised or suddenly shot with an arrow from behind on either side. I fell into a beaten road where I saw many tracks of human feet and some of cows, but most of horses. At last, I beheld several animals in a field and one or two of the same kind sitting in trees. Their shapes were very singular and deformed, with a, and with a, which a little discomposed me, so that I lay down behind a thicket to observe them better. Some of them coming forward near the place where I lay gave me an opportunity of distinctly marking their form. Their heads and breasts were covered with thick hair, some frizzled and others lank. They had beards like goats and a long ridge of hair down their back, and the forepart of their legs and feet, but the rest of their bodies were bare, so that I might see their skin, which were of a brown buff color, and they had no tails. They climbed high in trees as nimbly as squirrels, for they had strong extended claws before and behind, terminating in sharp points, and hooked, and they would often spring and bounce and leap with progenous agility. And it, then he goes down and he's describing them again. And he says, upon the whole, I never beheld in all of my travels so disagreeable an animal, nor one against which I naturally conceive so strong of an antipathy. So the thinking I had seen enough, full of contempt and aversion, I got up and pursued the beaten road, hoping it might direct me to the cabin of some Indian. I had not gone far when I met one of these creatures, full in my way, and coming up directly to me. The ugly monster, when he saw me, distorted several ways, ever features of his visual, and stared as at an object and he had never seen before. Then approaching near, lifted up his forepaw, where out of curiosity or mischief I could not tell. But I drew my hanger and gave him a good blow with the flat side of it for I durst not strike him with the edge, fearing the inhabitants might be provoked against me if they should come to know that I had killed or maimed any of their cattle. When the beast felt the smart, he drew back and roared so loud that a herd of at least 40 came flocking about me from the next field, howling and making odious faces. But I ran to the body of a tree and leaning my back against it, kept them off by waving my hanger. Several of the cursed Brodings, getting hooks on their branches, uh, began leaping up into the tree, from whence they began to discharge their excrements on my head. However, I escaped pretty well by sticking close to the stem of the tree, but was almost stifled with a filth which fell about me on every side. And so as Gulliver continues, he's, he gets away from these, or actually they're, they're surrounding him, and these horses couple of horses begin to walk in the field and all of a sudden these you know the 40 you know these beasts just take off they scatter and he's like wow you know th those horses for whatever reason you know frightened him so he went over and he you know went over to try to pet the horses and the horse kind of you know is kind of pulling away and as Gulliver was sitting there he noticed that the horses were looking at each other and it was this, as if they were talking to each other. They were in, speaking a language, something he did not understand, but he kept hearing them go back and forth, and they're talking. And pretty soon, he's able to kind of pick out a couple of words, and there was one word that kept coming over and over again that they kept saying. And so <clears throat> the best he could, he tried to pronounce what the noises, what the sound, what they were saying. And the word he said was Yahoo. Now, I know when I was a kid, my grandpa, you know, he was a very colorful man, you might say, and he'd be in the car driving, he'd start yelling at people, and he'd call me, you know, those, those yahoos, and, you know, a few other choice words in there, but that was one of the ways that he described people. What word yahoo today? Yahoo.com, right? And this piece of literature is where that word came from, yahoo. And so the, the horses kept talking back and forth, 
And so they, they and, and, and he keep trying to pronounce and talk. And so these horses, you know, they seemed as if, as he describes it, were very intrigued by him. He looked very different, but yet he looked familiar. So like the horses allowed him to come along with him. They went back to where the horses lived. And in this particular uh, land, the horses were the people that ruled, that ruled the, the island. They were, the, the, this was, peace was written during the age of reason, the enlightenment. And the horses were representing what reason was, enlightenment. And so the horses brought him back and there were other horses there, you know, it was like a community. And the, the, this one horse, you know, for some reason was very intrigued by Gulliver. And he allowed them to, you know, to stay there with them. But the other horses were kind of like, yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know about this guy. And when he came in, those creatures that surrounded him out in the field, those odious, horrible animals, he's seen one of them just like we would have our dog kind of chained up and they would throw some food there and feed it. And that was what the Yahoo was, was that, that odious, horrible animal. And as you read through the story, each time that they talk about the Yahoos, it is described as ugly monster, cursed race, odious animal, filthy, deformed, mischievous, and malicious. And so as they keep going on through, they allow Gulliver to, to stay there overnight. And so they, the, 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 the main horse begins to talk with Gulliver. And he keeps, like they're teaching each other their own language. And soon, Gulliver is able to communicate with them as they are to communicate with him. And so Gulliver begins telling them all about the human race and the Euro Europe and the known world. And the horses then were too sharing with him their knowledge, what they knew about, and them as well. But the, horse, the horses kept looking at him, and they're like, you know, you look a little bit, maybe even a lot of bit similar to those yahoos out there. But you're nothing like them. You're nicely dressed, you're clean shaven, you don't have the claws. You, I mean, there's, you know, there's so, some features about you that's like a yahoo. But yet, you know, you're, 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 you're a cleaned up, you're, you, you have manners, and you have some element of reason to you. And so they allowed him to stay, but yet these, the other horses that were there were still kind of like, you know, I, I don't know about this guy. And so, you know, he allows him to, you know, he stays there for quite a while. He gets to know their ways, and he really begins to enjoy the company of these horses. And the horses in the story are called the Winhams. And as, as time goes on, <clears throat> he begins to look back to Europe and look back at everything he knew, and he doesn't really miss it anymore. He is enjoying his time here with the Winhams. And so then the point comes to a head in the story, the climax, you might say, where the council of horses is getting together because they want nothing to do with this Gulliver. They just don't trust him. And so they're, they're beginning to gather together their counseling of what is the fate going to be of Gulliver. Please turn to James chapter 1, verse 19. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 19. Now this is a familiar passage. Many of you could probably quote many of the verses out of here. Many of you know it. And yet, this is such an important, important passage. And if you look at the, the title heading uh, of this section here in my Bible, and yours is probably somewhat close or similar, it says, listening and doing. And really, this is the big idea of this section that, that we're going to read. So I'm going to begin reading in chapter 1, verse 19. Dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about righteousness, the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says." Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looked like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. 
If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And as I said, the big idea in this passage is take action. And I would say, you know, the, 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 the verse I key in on is, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Plain and simply, just a few words, do what it says. And, you know, we see with Jesus. Jesus was very kind. Jesus was very loving. But Jesus didn't beat around the bush with people. He got straight to the point. And, you know, we, we see like, you know, say the woman at the well. He was kind, he was loving, and he told her about the living water, about himself. But yet, he was straightforward when he says, go call thy husband. I have no husband. Well, you yeah, that is true. You've had five, and the one you are now with, you are living with, is not your husband. He was straightforward, kind and loving, but got right to the point of the sin in her life and how she needed him, she needed Christ, she needed the living water. And think about Jesus interacting with the Pharisees. Was he not very straightforward and straight up with them? Why did sepulchers, vipers? I mean, he was straight up about you know, their, their problems, their issues, their sin in their lives. And we see many times where people would come to them and he would <clears throat> say, your sins are forgiven you know, because of your faith and yet go and sin no more. Jesus was straight up. And James here does not sugarcoat anything. James is just straight up in what he says. And he's telling you, do what it says. Even if you look at the beginning of the book, James doesn't sit here and lay people on the couch and we're going to give them therapy. And let's talk about what happened when you were a kid. Your problems must have been because of your parents. James doesn't do that, does he? No, he's like straightforward to the point and he gets right into the beginning of the book telling about trials in our life and what you need to do about them. We get into this chapter and he says, don't just listen to it, do it. And yet, you know, many times working in ministry, being a pastor, I've had adults and, you know, working with teenagers, many times a teen or somebody come to me and say, you know, Pastor Sean, I'm just not growing. I'm not being fed. And sometimes people will leave a church saying I'm not being fed. And so generally when somebody says that, I'll begin to ask them some probing questions. And I might start off with asking, well, how's your prayer life? I don't mean just before a meal, because most Christians pretty much do that every meal. But are you really talking to God each day? Well, uh, no, no not, not regularly is usually the answer I get. And then I'll ask him, well, how about your devotions? How about getting into God's word beyond just church, beyond just when we're meeting together? Are you doing that regularly? Well, well n n you know, kind of stutter a little bit, no. And okay, well, how about are you practicing and living out what you're learning? And then the answer's still usually kind of shaky. And what I find interesting is you'll have some of the, you know, in that same group of people, other, others who you see and you know who are plugged in, following God with their whole heart, doing the things they should do, and they are probably more mature believers, and yet they have no complaints about what's being taught, what they're learning, because it's the very same stuff that the other ones are learning. What's the difference? And I'd say it's a heart issue. And sometimes we look at some and say, oh, I've heard this before. And we just kind of click, shut our mind off. Because I've heard it or I don't want to hear it. And, you know, sometimes too when I've had people come to me and it used to really bother me because then I would really examine. And, you know, I still try to examine because I want to be a better preacher, better pastor, better leader. And I've been sitting there thinking, man, I'm not a very deep person, am I? I'm pretty shallow, actually. And as I look and think about it, I don't know, but I, I just see things really black and white. I, that's why I, I like James. It's straightforward. It says, here's what you need to do, now do it. 
doesn't beat around the bush, doesn't you know, ask all the reasons of why don't you do this and how and what and digging in deeper about different things. Now, there are times in scripture where God is very merciful. God is very gracious to us. You think of Moses, when God's asking Moses to go and to lead, and Moses starts giving all the excuses, well, I stutter, I can't talk, and, and God graciously each time answers him, go, I, I, who made man's mouth? I am with you. And then about the miracles, God does all these miracles and showing Moses, you know, hey, I'm with you. And finally, after excuse, excuse, God finally gets angry. He's like, Moses, just go. Just go do it. And that's why I like James. It's just straight to the point, straight up, gets right to the point, just go do it. And I know sometimes I'll have people come into my office and they'll, they'll want to sit down and talk to me. And they'll, they'll, and I know sometimes it's hard to open up about things. And sometimes people kind of be going around the edges. And I don't know, I'm just a matter of fact, straight to the point kind of thing. And, and I, I know like, you know, I, I could say it's like Vanway. He'd be going around the corner. I go, Vanway, just be straight up. Just tell me what's on your mind. I can handle it. Let's, you know, and then he's like, okay. And then he feels more comfortable and then we talk and, you know, and then that happens quite often. But I, I like things just straight up. Just tell me, what do I, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to do to fix it? Let's go. Let's do it. But yet we make things so difficult. We do. We hear it, hear it, hear it, and we don't do anything about it. And I, I have an illustration up here. And let me make a big mess, hopefully. <laughs> Usually that's what happens when I get doing stuff. Um, we have this sponge here. Great for cleaning, right? And, you know, to, to get this, through, you know, right now it's pretty dry. But if I've got to go and there's some dirt on there and I want to scrub it off, what do I need to do? I need, I need to put a little water in it, dump it in the bucket or, you know, put some water on it here. Yep, see, I'm already getting on the floor. <laughs> but, you know, you get some water on it, so it's useful, right? Kind of wring that out, and you can take that water, and now you can start scrubbing. And when that wood starts messing up, you can tell Pastor Dean who did it. Um, anyway, the, the sponge is useful, you know, and you keep, you know, if, if you need to keep cleaning, you've got to clean more. You've got to keep dipping it in water, pouring water into it, wring it out a little bit, and use it and scrub it. Well, how about if we take this sponge, though, and we set it there, and we just pour some water in it there, and we pour some more water in it there, and we keep pouring a little more, and we do a little more, and then that stupid sponge sets there in the bottom of your sink under dishes for two or three days, like my kids do sometimes. Um, <laughs> what happens to that sponge? It starts to stink. It becomes moldy and it becomes gross and you know all this yucky slimy water dripping off of it and you don't really want to scrub your dishes with that do you no and yet in our christian life here's god's word we're that sponge and we're soaking it up 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 more water more water more water and then eventually we're stinking up the place True, we're not doing anything, we're not being useful, we're not making use of that sponge, scrubbing, cleaning, being active, out doing things. And guys, in our spiritual life, God's word is being poured into us each day and we're doing nothing about it. We're just sitting there, sitting there, soaking more up, soaking more up, and then eventually we're sitting there saying, I'm not being fed, I'm not learning, I'm not growing. It's because you're not being wrung out and, being, and using what God has given you. Because you can take on can, can that sponge after a while take on more water? I mean, because if I keep like, you know, if I kept pouring, 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 it's at the point now where it's not going to take on any more water, right? It needs to be wrung out. It needs to be, do some more stuff. Then more water can be put into it. Guys, with God's word, you need to use it. You need to put it to use. It's going to do you absolutely no good. You're a useless, stinky sponge if you're not doing anything with what God has given you. And I know it's kind of a dumb, I don't know, illustration, but yet, think about it. I mean, that's what we become when we continue hearing, 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 but not doing. And I know this is like a so elementary, ABC is really simple. I've heard that before, but we're not doing it. And let's go to verse 23. <clears throat> Anyone who listens to the word but 
does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Guys, God's word is a mirror. It's a true mirror. It shows a true reflection of who you and I are. Warts, scars, messy hair, ugly face. I don't know, probably, probably some of you. But anyway, it shows who we are, the good and the bad. Now, you know, a lot of us would like to have in our house one of those fun house mirrors that, you know, make us look skinny. So when we get up in the morning, like, oh, my diet's working pretty well. You know, I'm eating everything I want. And, you know, those mirrors are really not a true representation of you, right? They distort you. And yet God's word is that true, clear picture of just who you are. Warts and all. And it's something that we should be looking into and saying, what do I need to fix today? What do I need to correct? And, you know, we come to church and, you know, maybe some of you are sleeping right now. Or maybe some of you, your mind is wandering and you're thinking about brunch after this, this, this service. And, you know, and maybe some of you are thinking, I just wish Pastor Sean would be finished. I wish he'd be done. And, you know, but if we go out for lunch later, or say I see you on Monday, or see you on Tuesday, and say, what was Sunday's message about? Sometimes you struggle to remember what it was. And sometimes it's just hours after. And I, I hate to admit this, but in staff meeting, we have staff meetings here on Tuesdays. And there's myself, Diane, there's Glenn, Susan, that all at least go to church here. And, you know, what we do at the beginning is we have a devotion. And Pastor Dean opens a Bible to what he's going to be preaching on that given, you know, the up and coming week. And he reads through it. And then we talk about it because I think that's a great idea because, you know, we bounce ideas off each other. Maybe we say something. He's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, you know, and maybe writes it down. And sometimes, though, you know, because, you know, Pastor Dean preaches exegetically and we're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, he'll ask us a question about Sunday. And sometimes we've sat there and go, uh, uh, and he's like, thanks, guys, for really listening to what I have to say on Sunday mornings. Now, it's mostly Diane. But, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding with her. But... <clears throat> But I, I, I've done it too. I, and you know, we, we, we've done it, right, Diane? I mean, we, at times we've sat there and struggled to remember. And guys, how can we do what we don't remember? Because we're kind of just kind of that part in our brain where we listen, it's going in, but it's really not, you know, we're not listening. Like my wife says many times, she's talking and I'm, my eyes are open, I'm listening, but I don't remember what she said. You know, it's something you've got to work on. I'm not saying it's good, but anyway, we do it, Right? And you sit here Sunday, and some of you will leave and forget what we've talked about this morning. <clears throat> How can you put to action what you don't remember? When we come to church each week, we open the mirror of God's word, and maybe your heart is stirred. But then, as you walk away, you forget, and no action occurs. You're well-intentioned, but it just kind of, the busyness of life gets to you and you just forget about it. Or, you know, there are some people, and in every church we have them too, people show up on Sunday mornings because it's their duty. It's something they've always done. They've always gone to church. <clears throat> the only time we see them all week long is just the one Sunday morning service and that is it. Their life does not reflect Christ outside of the building. People might not even know that they're a Christian. Every church has them. They feel like they came, they did their duty, and they go away. <clears throat> they're seeing the mirror, they're hearing God's word, but it's not affecting and changing their life whatsoever. There's also people that fall into that category. But then also, there's some of us, they say, we love God, and we're trying to serve him. But we have certain areas of our life where we're comfortable with. And we just don't want to change it. 
We're okay with the, that messy hair or whatever it is. You're like, I, I can live with it. I'm okay with that. We see it in the mirror. We know it's a problem, but we're comfortable with it. And we walk away and forget about it. And, you know, many of you have probably sit there and said, I've been a Christian for a long time. As Pastor Dean's pa preaching through John, I've heard it a hundred times. And th this message on James chapter one, I've heard this message 10 times already. And the nine others were much better, more interesting. And that may be, but is it sinking in? Is it something you're actually listening to go, okay, I'm gonna go actually do something about this. I'm gonna take action. And guys, we, we need to get serious about our Christian life. We make it so difficult. Guys, it's pretty much shut up or do it. Just do it. I mean, it's, I mean we, we, why do we make it so difficult? Well, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've been through. And yes, we've been through tough things. All of us have had tough things in life. But is James sugarcoating it? Is he saying, that's okay, I understand, da, 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 and you know, we can blame all this on your parents and what this person and that person did. Is, is that what the Bible's saying? Is that what James said? Are, are you responsible for what you do? Are you responsible for your own actions? Yeah. Just do it. And yet that's so difficult. And you know, is it possible that a mature Christian can come in here, come into church each week, hear God's word, and continue to grow, and continue to be convicted, and continue, even if they're doing something well and right, to say, you know what, I can do better, I can do more. Is that possible? Yes, of course it is. But yet a lot of us think, I got this, I'm good, I'm mature, and you know, we make that big mistake, and I think this is part of what keeps us from growing at times, is we compare ourselves amongst each other. And the Bible says that he who compares himself amongst themselves is not wise. And, you know, I mean, think about it. I hang out with Pastor Dean, Harry, Luke, Todd, Dan, Ryan, Mike. They're a pretty motley crew. I look pretty good compared to those guys. <laughs> I don't need to change much if I'm comparing my crowd of people I hang around with. I'm pretty close to glory compared to them. And yet, it causes us to just be static, to just be comfortable, to not want to change because I got my problems, but I'm not near as bad as that guy down the aisle over there. I'm doing pretty good. And yet, does God's word say you get to a point and then you're, you're totally fully mature? No. Sanctification is progressive in the sense that from the day one of your new birth to the day you die, you should be growing continually. None of us ever arrive. But yet spiritually, we think we have. And we just stay static. Do you think it's kind of hard for a pastor sometimes? We've been a Christian for a long time. We went to Bible college. We teach the Bible all the time. We're in our office reading. It could become difficult for us too, but yet God requires all of us to continue to grow, grow, grow. We all have our problems and our issues. It, we sit idly by, we look into that mirror, and we're not growing, we're not changing. We're walking away and forgetting what we've seen each and every week. And if some of you were wondering about the rest of our story, I'm getting to that. And as, you know, the council is going, trying to decide about Gulliver, in the meantime, as Gulliver's there in the land, this event occurs. When I thought of my family, my friends, my countrymen, or the human race in general, I consider them as they really were, yahoos, in shape and disposition, perhaps a little more civilized, and qualified with the gift of speech, but making no other use of reason than to improve and multiply those vices, whereof their brethren in this country had only the share that nature allotted them. When I happened to behold, now get this, 
the reflection of my own form in a lake or fountain, I turned away my face in horror and destation of myself and could better endure the sight of a common Yahoo than that of my own person. Guys, at this point in the story, Gulliver realizes, he sees himself, he sees his reflection and realizes, I am no better than those detestable, odious, horrible creatures, those yahoos. I am a yahoo. You are a yahoo. And there's many different things that this particular passage is written about. I mean, that, that story. But part of the satire is talking about reason and the age of enlightenment. And, you know, there's some stuff that, you know, don't have time to really deal with that. But part of it is talking about the depravity of man, sin. Remember, I said he was a clergyman. And so, you know, it's, it's getting to the point here of where Gulliver realizes I'm no better than they are. That, you know, comparison that, well, I'm a little more civilized, I dress better, I might look a little bit like those guys, but I'm not them. And yet he realizes, I'm one of them. And we need to come to the point where we quit comparing ourselves with our neighbor, with the people down the block, whatever, and realize, I need to change some things about my life. I've looked in the mirror, and I shouldn't be liking what I'm seeing. And as the story goes on, the, the horses, the Winhams, they expel him because they just don't trust him. And then a sea captain comes and he, he rescues him. And Gulliver has a hard time being around them because he thinks they smell bad because he's been hanging out with the horses lately. And he just, you know, like he, he's like, you know, these odious creatures. He's still feeling pretty, yeah, you know, about human race because of depravity, you know, of men and their vices. And he talks about it in the story of drunkenness, debauchery, and, you know, all the list goes on. And, you know, funny, funny enough, when uh, he gets back to his uh, family, it says here about his wife and children, as soon as I entered the house, my wife took me in her arms and kissed me, at which having not been used to the touch of that odious animal for so many years, I fell into a swoon for almost an hour. And, you know, I mean, even, even his wife described as an odious animal. And, you know, later on, you know, he begins to kind of gain a, a more balanced view of these things, but he realizes his own problems he realizes he's looked in the mirror and going, wow, I got to fix some things. And guys, in that, that latter verse, the last verse, guys, the gospel, God's word, it gives us freedom. You know, we look at God's word as a bunch of list of do's and don'ts. And it's like, it ruins my fun. It tells me I can't do all the fun stuff, but I got to do all this stuff. Guys, God's word liberates us. It liberates us from the sin. And sin is bondage. And guys, it says that if we do those things, we look into that mirror, we work on those things, we start listening and doing, it says we will be blessed. And guys, you know, many times when I get up here and preach, or Pastor Dean, we'll give you a list of like five things of, here's how you can apply what you've learned today. I don't feel like doing that today. I'm just going to say straight up, as James says, defer to the Bible here, don't be just a listener, do it. How hard is that? Do it. Quit making it hard, quit making excuses, just do it. That's what God says. And as that leads us into this morning, we have communion. And communion is a time where we reflect on our lives. We reflect on the sin, the issues, the things. Because this is a solemn time where just last week we celebrated Easter. We celebrated what Christ did, that Christ came to this world. He loved us. He died on the cross and he paid for our sins. And he offered us free, as a free gift, salvation. And that's an awesome, awesome thing. But the Bible talks about, too, that this is a time where as we come together, examine our hearts, examine our lives. 
as I said, I was not going to give you a big list, but I want you right now, think of a couple things. Think of one thing. Think of two things. What do you need to work on in your life? What do you need to change? What have you been listening, listening, listening to and just choosing not to do? Get those things right with God at this time and at this point. At Grace Bible Church, you do not have to be a member to be with us to partake in communion. But what you do have to be is a member of the body of Christ, that you've placed your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior. And so at this time, I'm going to have Todd pray for the bread, please.